Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for joining us once again in, in this uh, space gatherings called Cosmica. Um, I've been away for a few months and I just want to say that it's good to be back. And uh, yeah, Cosmica seems to be, I mean, this is the fifth or sixth Cosmica we organize. And, and maybe for next year we have some very exciting plans. Uh, think of a festival. So we're, we're working hard on, on, on extending this program and inviting more people and, 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 and showing it to, to, to even more audiences. So tonight we, well, first of all, if you, if you are tweeting, we are using the hashtag Cosmica, if you want to share your, your comments on, on, online. And we are also uh, online streaming on the internet, so if next time you can come, just go to the website and there's going to be a link so you can watch it from everywhere. Uh, okay, so well, tonight we have a, a, a very interesting program. Um, you, you will see. But well, we're going to start with Ann Schumann. And well, just a quick uh, notes about Ann Schumann Biswas. He was born in Calcutta and then he was trained in the UK. He, he's a, an exceptional artist. He's worked in every single art form, that be dance, film, music. He, he, he's played with the London Philharmonic Orchestra, toured with New York Oasis. Um, he's worked a lot in, uh, well, between science, art, and, and the industry. Uh, he's also, well, a trustee of the Arts Catalyst. And he, 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 he's part of the European, of, of this study group in the European Space Agencies for the Cultural uh, Utilization of Space. So, well, I don't want to say more, and we're going to start with a video, and he will explain us what we will be watching. Thank you. So Naam asked me to talk about uh, zero gravity, um, and I thought I might talk with great gravity about nothing, which is a, a long-running interest of mine, nothing. Uh, but in fact, I thought I might just begin with an image of negation um, of a space in which there is no gravity. In fact, there's nothing. Inside this box, there is absolutely nothing. Or at least, um, we can't say what there is, which is the same thing as nothing, according to 
Wittgenstein, for instance. So there's no way of describing or measuring what is inside this box from the outside. So this piece called Cat is, in fact, the first piece that uh, I made with Art Catalyst um, in 1990. Well, I started working on it in, in 1996, 97, I think. And uh, this is an installation that happened at the South London Gallery in 1998. And um, I was trying to be, well, I was Schrodinger's cat in this piece. The cat, which is in, in an indeterminate state, which is uh, neither dead nor alive. I was in a space in which there are no physical properties at all that can be spoken about. There's no light, there's no sound, there's no mass, there's no velocity, there's no gravity. There's nothing at all. And uh, one of the discoveries I made in this space is that nature abhors a vacuum. I mean, other people have made that discovery before me. But um, I really experienced that by making this space invisible. I mean, I was inside there. It wasn't invisible to me. But it, what was happening inside there was invisible and unknowable to anyone outside. And... Um, it became flooded with people's uh, um, imaginations. So I created a void of knowledge which became filled with fiction. Uh, stories that people made up of me uh, wasting away or growing angelic wings or um, anything between those two extremes. So, um, I wanted to think about this space as well as being a space of zero. Uh, uh, literally, sunyagar is the uh, is a Pali or Sanskrit term to describe a room from which everything is removed as far as possible. Uh, and when you remove everything that you can, what's left? Open little snitch configuration. Maybe that's what's left. A uh, little snitch. The little snitch is our consciousness, who is constantly um, narrating ourselves, perhaps. Um, so, a senyagar literally is a zero room. And uh, it's a space in which, from which everything is removed. Uh, it's a kind of ideal, it's, it's, the, it's an ideal room in science. Uh, it's the black box of, um, of information uh, science into which an input goes and out of which an in output comes and then what happens inside is some mysterious process. But I wanted to think about this zero room as a kind of spaceship. Um, perhaps like the spaceship that Carl Sagan invented in the film Contact. Do you remember that film with Zodi uh, with, um Jodie Foster, uh, who goes nowhere, falls into a wormhole or something. I don't quite understand Carl Sagan's science, <laughs> but it was a spaceship that didn't go out there very far. Uh, to all intents and purposes, for, for the observers, uh, look, watching the spaceship, it just fell into the sea, I think. But um, the idea of a, a space which can be a, a space of uh, traveling, that was interesting for me. This idea of, a, of um, and perhaps this what is what a spaceship might look like if you weren't hung up on um, big phallic rockets and uh, fossil fuels. The kind of spaceship that we might build might be more efficient. So, um, I'm going to read you uh, uh, one of the poems. I, I wrote a kind of book of poems and essays 
uh, called Cats that went along with this piece. And I'm going to read you uh, one of the poems. It's called Black Magic. I will stand stinking of horses and bulls, a black body in your clean room. I will stand in chains, shaking with the noise of battle, still ringing in my bones. I will stand behind and wait, unavoidable, invisible, ready to serve you with nothing. I will be an uncomfortable silence around your table while the food you eat turns to mud. I will be your snigger, your chink, the packy in your galley. I will be the dung in your gallery, the bones of your china, scrutinized, inscrutable. I will be a shadow in your white room, a dark continent in your icy waist. I will be the bruise on your skin, the black eye like a toad in your milk. I will be the voodoo doll, all ribbons and earth in your surgeon's sterile theatre. I will be the first house, the Kaaba in your cathedral. I will be the lead in your coffers, the alchemist's crucible, left burnt and cooling, an embarrassment in Newton's study. I will be the edge in your plane, the blindness in your wit, your ultraviolet catastrophe, a black spot. I will hold you a prisoner outside the prison you have built while I swim in darkness. Okay, so that was um, uh, a kind of negation of gravity, and it was, as I say, the first piece that I uh, um, made with art. It's when I met Art Catalyst, in fact, um, and uh, we made that piece. So um, I'd like to now skip to uh, a couple of other pieces that also deal with gravity and um, microgravity and zero gravity and changing gravity fields. Um, and talk about uh, a piece called Wave Particle, which, was, which arose from a provocation by uh, Arts Catalyst to think about the kinds of projects that might be interesting to do in zero gravity. So um, I started thinking about a musical instrument, a kind of musical instrument that might be um, suited to a zero gravity environment. And I, I was thinking about um, uh, percussion, gongs and cymbals, and the way that a gong has to be hung from a string, or a cymbal has to be on a cymbal stand, so it has to be fixed at some point. So when you hit it, uh, not all of it is vibrating, some part of it is fixed. So I, I tried to imagine a kind, of, um, uh, a kind of instrument, a kind of percussion instrument, that if you hit it could just ring and ring and ring without being damped in any way. So I was, I was this was the kind of image I had. If you imagine this. Every time, because of gravity, I throw this bunch of keys up. Every time it falls and it lands in my hands again and, therefore, and then stops ringing. So I was imagining a kind of a ring that might uh, be able to con go continuously. Um, and eventually arrived um, at this, 
design of a kind of piece of music made up of these ringing balls. Uh, bao they're made in Baoding in China. These, you've probably seen them, they're sort of hand exercise balls which, have, uh, which make a little ringing sound as they move. So the box that you see on the right is... Um, yeah, sound up. The box on the right has these uh, balls in it. So this is filmed on board a parabolic flight from Star City in Moscow. Uh, and so the trajectory of the air aircraft determines the structure of the sound. So every time the aircraft drops and you have um, negative gravity or uh, weightless conditions, the balls ring and float up in the air. And then when we go into uh, uh, positive gravity, then uh, the balls are damped and they stop. So that's one half of this piece, wave particle. It's the particle half, which came from a musical idea. The other half, uh, this was incidentally, uh, this piece was made in collaboration with Jem Finer, who some of you may have uh, heard here at Cosmic Earth last month, I think. Uh, we worked together on this, um, and the other half of it was came from the idea of how astronauts and cosmonauts might exercise on very long journeys through space. And uh, we thought of having a swimming pool, a huge swimming pool in space, might look like a globe of water that you could dive into and swim right through and emerge out of the other side and clamber onto the shore and dry yourself off. Um, so a huge uh, sphere of water that you could swim around inside. So we thought about how liquids would behave in uh, these microgravity conditions. So another, the other half of the screen, with the left hand side, is inspired by that idea of liquids in zero gravity. This is in fact a mixture of uh, water and glycerine and uh, food coloring. fields um, through liquids and discrete solids. 
Okay, um, this can be, let's go, um, it can be um, shown in different ways. Uh, yeah, that's great. So, um, in fact, the three screens, the, the, the two uh, the screens on the left and the right are two separate um, uh, actual boxes with balls and liquids in them, and the middle screen is a superimposition of the two. And they can be played with independently. If you go to the website, zerogenie.org, uh, there's a little game of those three screens that you can just play with and uh, move around uh, in, uh, within the sequence of the, the whole image. So you can play around with the, the image and the sound and kind of make your own mix. It's kind of a little DJ tool. So uh, this next, I'm gonna just very quickly show you um, a, a project that is connected to that, which actually hasn't yet been realized, but may yet one day, which um, uh, was inspired by a trip to the Hydra Lab at Star City in Moscow. The Hydra Lab is this thing. You walk into a building and um, you walk down these long corridors and look through windows and look into just nothingness, blue. Um, and then you see a little silver bubble gradually uh, rise up to the surface and you realize you're, what you're looking at is in fact a huge body of water. So it's a building that is filled with water and it's used for training um, uh, training uh, cosmonauts to work in, zero, in uh, uh, zero gravity conditions. And uh, our idea, this again is a project with uh, Jem Viner and myself, was to make these balls that are neutrally buoyant, that float uh, that where you put them. Now, and then uh, we make them into shapes, essentially, um, which are based on uh, water molecule structures. Um, so it's a kind of game with divers uh, making these, uh, these objects uh, uh, into different various kind of arrays. So, Jem uh, and I have been training in um, scuba diving in order to make this piece, and it's a, it gives us a kind of insight in a, in a more sustainable way. I mean, I've only been up in, uh, on a parabolic flight once, but I've been scuba diving many times. It's much cheaper, more accessible, uh, easier to scuba dive, which is why cosmonauts and astronauts use it to train um, to uh, operate and work in um, different gravity conditions. Because you can simulate zero gravity uh, underwater by having suits with lead weights at um, strategic points so that you're, you feel like you're in a weightless uh, environment. Of course, you never are exactly weightless underwater uh, and there's always a resistance, which is very different from uh, being in air in zero gravity. You, with, in water, you always have something to push against. But um, it's a, a sl it kind of simulates to some extent. Uh, the most non-trivial part of this project is actually making the spheres that will be neutrally buoyant. And uh, we've been working on the design and it's, uh, it's really quite difficult um, because uh, of the different pressures and temperatures and densities of water. Okay, can we just go to the last video now? So that's just a little taste of a piece that um, uh, is, is related in some way, uh, it, neutral buoyancy as an analogue of uh, microgravity. Okay, finally, uh, I'd just like to finish, this is a 10 minute film uh, made again by uh, myself and Jem Finer, and um, it's, uh, well, uh, well, I'll just let you watch it, actually, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
Any anybody have any questions? Why? Come on. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for Schumann. Yes. Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. Just um, one question. Tell me something about Cat and how uh, it's the first time I saw it, even though I was there. Yes. I was one of the figures running around. Could you just tell me about the uh, the, the way you uh, created that video? Because um, I, I'm really interested to know how you processed the, uh, the, the, the camera. The so there was a, a camera mounted in the corner of the South London Gallery, uh, which I think you were probably changing the, yeah. the tape in um, whenever it ran out. Uh, and um, uh, I, I've got these bags of um, uh, VHS tapes, and I basically just digitized them and speeded them up. It's 240 hours of footage, so it's 24 hours a day uh, over 10 days, uh, from the beginning to the end of the, of the period, just to prove that I didn't leave the box at any point. And um, I just speeded up the footage, basically. Most of it. Uh, it's, not, it's not everything there. It's not complete. It's not complete, no. But it's, uh, it's mostly. I didn't catch the bit when you were coming out. Yeah, that's because um, it was quite dark. Because um, there were lots of. Um, I mean, it's a bit like going on a long space journey, perhaps. You don't quite know what's going to happen to you at the end of it and what kind of state you'll be in. I wasn't sure, for instance, if uh, my eyes would be damaged by suddenly being in bright light. 
after having been in darkness for 10 days. Um, so I, I said uh, that on the way out, maybe it'd be useful just immediately that I was, um, I came out of the box, that um, perhaps the lights should be low and maybe there should be a, a candle or a torch or something like that. Um, and of course, uh, as the artist, it's quite strange not to be, to be completely out of control of your piece for 10 days, because I was in the middle of the box. In the meantime, um, people outside, some people outside, had decided that they wouldn't just have a candle, but they would create this kind of ritual <laughs> around the box um, with candles. So all the lights were put out, and then there were this, this circle of candles uh, into which I emerged um, like a kind of messiah. <laughs> were, you, were you um, very aware of temperature changes in the box? Um, I mean, did you get, I don't know, if you had, did you get hot? Uh, because there's no visual stimulation, is it? Is it more aware? Yeah, there was some. Um, well, there was all kinds of, yeah, I was, I, I was, there was all sorts of sensory awareness. I mean, I was practicing. Um, a scientific practice called Vipassana meditation, um, which is a way of uh, paying attention to uh, physical sensations. It's a way of doing physics, actually, without any instrumentation except one's own consciousness. So I was, I was aware of every other sense apart from uh, vision. I mean, I couldn't actually, I didn't know whether my eyes were open or closed without touching my face, for instance. So I didn't know when I did visualize things whether I was actually seeing them or just dreaming. Um, um, so, but my, you know, I, I had no uh, visual awareness at all, and the box was soundproofed, so it was pretty. There was almost no sound at all. Although I discovered that there's a kind of genetic urge in people when you find the box to knock on it. Uh, so, <clears throat> and there was a school nearby. So, um, it seems to be particularly in the young of the human species. Uh, so there was there was knocking. So I, I knew. Occasionally, when it was daytime, because um, uh, there were knocks on the doors. Unless I don't know, unless the place was haunted. There was, and there, was, a gong there was a gong because at um, uh, because also I had no way of telling the time. I didn't know when ten days were. I didn't even know when ten minutes were up, or two days, or three days, or ten days. But uh, so I needed a signal to come out to just to prepare myself a little bit. I, I wasn't sure what state I'd be in at the end. And so I had a signal um, of a very loud gong outside uh, for the last six hours played every hour. And then in the last hour played every 10 minutes. And in the last 10 minutes played every minute. And then for the last minute just played continuously um, until the door was opened up and I emerged into normal gravity. So you had no idea from day one until six hours to go, time perception? No, no. But I mean, I, I wasn't... Um, I, it wasn't like I was trying to keep track of time. I was just trying to be aware of the changing sensations that were happening in the body. Did you keep a notebook or, uh, I mean, some sort of log or record or...? I am the log. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, Some people would think I am the log. That um, I mean, you know, the, the body is the recording. I mean, it's an interesting coincidence that we just, for no reason, thought of running the Mars 500 um, video before you gave your talk, and actually it turned out to be quite resonant because what they're doing there is they're like in a box, yeah. and it's kind of weird because it's woodlined and they're doing on um, exercise, but they're not in zero gravity, they're just in a box in Moscow, basically, still yeah. sitting, yeah. they're still there now. Um, but what, what's interesting is that what you've done, what you did, which I can fully realized, even though I was totally involved in the project, is explore an analog exploration situation in a totally different way. Because you would notice you were sealed for 10 days, but you were also sealed off from sensory input, whereas they are connected and they're sending messages, they're tweeting, they're doing all of that stuff. And that, but at the same time, there's something slightly banal about the fact that they're in this box going about their everyday life and they've got to be there for, for 500 days as a mild simulation. So it was very interesting actually to, to visualize what you were doing in your box and compare it to what those people right now are doing in Mars 500. Yeah, I, I mean it's, it's slightly sad that um, we have to reinvent the wheel in this way 
uh, when in fact uh, the tradition of this kind of spaceship, the Sanyagar, as I mentioned, the zero room, uh, goes back at least uh, 3,000 years. Uh, people have been using this kind of method of traveling, uh, of um, exploration, uh, for a very long time. And it's, uh, there's a very rigorous uh, methodology involved, um, and uh, there are ways to do it uh, whereby you get lost, and there are ways to do it where you arrive at your destination. Um, so there are ways to navigate through this um, uh, landscape, uh, which is the cosmos, which is, you know, which is the cosmos. They did that with the sensory deprivation tanks in California the, in the 70s and the 60s. Or no, they didn't do this. Didn't do no, this. because this has nothing to do with deprivation at all. Um, and uh, in the sensory deprivation tanks, as far as I know, uh, there wasn't a rigorous uh, methodology involved. You just lay there and floated and you drifted off. You literally drifted. Um, in this case, the technique of uh, Vipassana meditation, which I was presenting as an, as an analog or as a, um, a kind of logical next stage in the way that we do science, is a very rigorous uh, methodology. And um, I, I mean, I believe that Western scientists and the kind of people that lock themselves up um, in boxes nowadays uh, will eventually come round to uh, recognizing the kind of means of propulsion that have been developed over uh, many thousands of years. I'm very interested to know if there's any scientists in the audience who've got an opinion on that. Yeah, somebody has. Yeah, I'll take the mic, hang on. <clears throat> when, you, when you say a means of propulsion, what exactly do you mean? Sorry. Can you shout out because I've taken the mic off? Yeah. Um, uh, where, where are you going? Yeah, well, it, well exactly, where are you going? Um, I mean, uh, what's being explored uh, uh, will determine in which direction you go to look for it. Um, and uh, but when you say, Also, when you say this is a form of science, are you rejecting the scientific method the way that we... The way that I don't know I, that you you know you have a hypothesis you test the hypothesis you use the hypothesis to make new predictions you test the new predictions how does that fit in with your uh, uh, there, way of doing science? There are very testable uh, hypotheses uh, in this in this method in this scientific method of um, examining the nature of phenomena. Uh, one part of phenomena are the materials involved. Another part of phenomena is um, our consciousness of the materials. Uh, it seems to me that it's, um, it's absurd to try to separate those two things and pretend that there is no conscious component to uh, phenomena. Uh, they have to be looked at as a whole. And so uh, I'm not rejecting anything about the way science is done at the moment. It just seems to me that science is only very creakily and gradually coming round, for instance, through uh, quantum mechanics, uh, is coming round to realizing uh, the uh, 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 seminal uh, place that consciousness uh, has. Well, but quantum mechanics doesn't require consciousness. If you want to break down a wave, yeah I mean there's a debate about whether there's a place for consciousness at all and, and this this um, this uh, thought experiment uh, by Schrodinger and Einstein uh, focuses exactly on that, um, on that debate of whether there is a place for the observer which is fundamental in the, the system. The observer doesn't have to be conscious. Because if you've got a double slit experiment and you want, you want to look at the quantum phenomenon, uh, if you want to break down the wave function, you can use a robot to do it, or you can use a human to do it. They both do it equally well. And there's no debate with the robot. I, 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 I'm not sure how you know whether the robot has done it or not. Isn't the robot observed? Isn't that what you've done? Um, 
No, no, so, no, there's no, a... no, 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 you can, that's a very good question. Yeah, well, that's, well, that's, 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 that's a very, very, very a can good of worms, question. Worms, actually. Actually. You, can, you can set up an experiment where you know that the robot has made the observation, but the conscious person never finds out what the robot has observed. But you know that the fact that the robot has made the observation changes the final result. How do you know that it's made it? Because uh, um, the classical experiment in quantum physics is called the double slit experiment. And what happens is you have uh, particles that start at one side of the room going through a slit. They go through that slit, and then they go through two slits. And then they, having gone through those two slits, they then arrive on the screen, like the screen there. It's a mirror there too, Sorry? It's a mirror. No, it's no mirror. Now, not, not in the simplest sense. And now, if they were acting as particles, then you would just get two regions on the screen where they've gone through the two slits. But if they're acting as waves, then you'd have uh, interference patterns, on them, like waves going through slits and harbor walls. Now, um, <clears throat> it turns out that if you, if you look at which slit they're going through, then they behave like particles. But if you don't look at which slip they're going through, they behave like waves. Now, a common misconception is it takes a conscious person to actually make that observation. But it's not true. Because if you just have a device, like a transistor or anything, which makes the observation, but you don't get the readout from the device, so the conscious person doesn't know which slip it's gone through, the conscious person still knows that something is observed which slip it's gone through because the interference happens. So our consciousness doesn't break down the right function. We still don't know how, how we don't know proof that the robot was actually observed. Then, back to my original question: How do we know? Because the interference pattern has changed. But who the observes that? We do. Ah. We so see the pattern on the screen. So consciousness does come into it. No. <laughs> uh, you're observing the result. We're observing the result, but we still don't know which mm. hole the bullet went through or the particle. So it's not. I think the consciousness does eventually. The debate actually with that, because I know the argument the argument for that, the debate is that the robot is actually part of an entanglement. So that, that it's it's where the consciousness ends that we created the experiment. Is it possible to have a one-line conversation that is about this? Utterly <laughs> <laughs> utterly impossible. We couldn't we couldn't have problems doing that. There's someone over here. Um, like, <laughs> you need to take the mic because we've got the live streaming. We're live streaming. Um, I don't claim to have a particularly in-depth knowledge of quantum mechanics, but I'm sure you know a lot more about it than I do, but I've been led to believe that it's not only in the double slit experiment that kind of observed things slash interference kind of causes problems and in fact like quantum computers have to be housed in a vacuum because any kind of kind of molecular interference can cause problems, is that Absolutely. true? I mean, yeah, we're not aware of the molecular interference. Mm. The conscious, there is no conscious person that's aware of that particular molecular interference, but that molecular interference will bring things down. Is that good or bad? Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad for, if you'd have gone to my 17-year-old LSD chomping self and told him, I would have been very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, come to the, our next uh, physics um, se session of uh, Cosmica, I think, to continue that. <laughs> okay, all right. Just one more quick question for us. First of all, I'd like to say, can you take the mic? Oh, sorry. First of all, I'd like to say it's incredibly brave the black box thing, having run away from two separate Vipassana courses after just four days. I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like in uh, the ten days that you did in such extreme circumstances. But um, just from a completely anoraki point of view, um, going to velocity, that word, with the actual parabolic flights, how fast is the plane going and how long does that actual weightlessness section last for? It looked really fun. I think it, it goes, it, it, uh, someone else may know the numbers better than me, but it goes from about 30,000 feet down to about 10,000 feet in about um, 30 to 40 seconds. Is that right? 
Yes. Yeah. Oh, so uh, so it goes from about uh, uh, thirty to twenty thousand feet. Nicholas says. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so it go it's, it's between thirty and twenty thousand feet that it describes an arc, basically. And it so the the period of of weightlessness uh, lasts about thirty forty seconds. Okay. Great. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.